Good morning to you. Let me go ahead and invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Today we're going to be looking at verses 31 through 38 together. Um, as you're turning there, let me just say, if you're here as a guest, if you're watching online, listen to our podcast later, we're so grateful for you. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today for worship. Uh, if you're here with me at John chapter 13, let me go ahead and invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. For the sake of time, we would just be reading verse uh, 31. Verse 31 says, When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Let's pray together. Father, this morning we rejoice in the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you that the work at the cross is finished, that it's accomplished. Lord, we thank you that through the cross, through the resurrection, we've been given new life. We thank you that you've given us a new commandment to love one another. And we thank you that in Jesus, there's now an ability to follow you. So, Lord, I pray this morning for a miracle in this place. Holy Spirit, would you move in power? Would you speak through your word to us, Lord? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. So, as we begin this morning, um, I just want to remind us of the context of our passage here in John chapter 13, because I think we go through each week just verse by verse. Sometimes it's easy to forget what's going on in our passage. So over the past few weeks, we've been spending our time in the upper room where Jesus is with his disciples, and they're having their last supper together. Uh, last week, we seen where Jesus, knowing that Judas was going to betray him, dips the bread uh, in the bowl, gives it to Judas. Judas, is, it says Satan enters Judas and then Judas gets up and leaves into the night. And this morning, we're picking up right after Judas leaves the upper room. So that's our basic context. But I just want to dive really quick, uh, uh, a little bit deeper into this situation. Um, Because I caught myself this week, as I was reading this text, like like I know that the 11 disciples are real people. They're like us. They, They... they think, they, 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 they're, they're normal people. But when I'm reading the text sometimes, not only this week, but any time, I tend to forget that they actually had emotions. That the people in the Bible reacted like us. They, they felt like us. They thought like us. They, they got angry. They got upset sometimes. Uh, they were excited. They rejoiced. They had fun. They enjoyed things like we enjoyed things. Uh, they got ticked off sometimes. Do you get angry sometimes like that? They did too. But other things brought them joy. They got depressed. They felt anxiety. They worried. They were caught off guard. They loved and cared. They had real relationships like us that brought all the real intricacies of a relationship. That's what they experienced too. They, like us, were real people. Now, I bring this up because when we read our text, it's easy to forget that these disciples had these emotions. Like, we read this text almost 2,000 years later, and we're like, well, duh, it's Jesus, right? They, they were around him. They should have known all these things by now before he tells them. But when we read, we can't overlook all of the emotion and relational connections that are in our passages, We can't forget that these 11 people completely loved Jesus. They they really lived life with him. They were with him every moment for almost three years. They they heard his teaching. They seen his miracles firsthand. And in this moment, this man who they gave up their jobs for, who they left their families for, This man, who they sold everything for, who they love so dearly, is telling them at this moment, I'm about to leave, and where I'm going, you can't follow me any longer. 
Say it a different way. Jesus is like, guys, I know you've been following me for the past three years, but where I'm going, you can't follow me any longer. Now, how would you react in that moment? I know how I would react. I would react like the disciples. <laughs> like, wait, what? Uh, can, can I click pause there, Jesus? Like, do you remember when I left my dad back on that boat? And I dropped the net and just followed you. You remember how I served you alongside of you for, for hours on end? It seems like every single day I was persecuted for you. I was mocked for you. Doesn't that even matter, Jesus? Like, what are we supposed to do then if you're leaving us? And this is where our passage this morning is beautiful. Because in this moment of hurt and shock, we see Jesus in the most tender way, sitting down with his devoted disciples. And like a father sitting with his children, knowing that they are hurt and confused, cares for them and explains to them everything that's about to happen. He doesn't just say, hey, I'm leaving. He tells them the significance and end result of his leaving. Does that make sense? It's like if you're in the kitchen right now, and someone says, hey, what are you doing? You're not just going to say, well, I'm just blending up the ingredients. No, you're saying, I'm making a cake, right? Jesus in John 13, 31 through 38 is giving his disciples the big picture as to what takes place when he leaves and goes to a cross. He's explaining how his work at the cross changes everything, both our relationship with God and our fellow Believer. So this morning, my main point is to simply look at Jesus' big picture explanation of his leaving to the cross, which is that the cross of Christ glorifies God, commands the community of faith to love one another, and enables people to follow Jesus. So for the remainder of our time, I want to look at these truths in this text and then want to practically apply them to our lives today. So first truth that we see in verses 31 through 33, is that the cross of Christ glorifies God. Go back with me at verse 31. It says, When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. So as we begin, I think it's important to understand what God's glory is in the Bible. So uh, there's two aspects in the Bible. One is that of honor or excellent reputation. So, so think high esteem or worthiness, like, like a royal king. It, it's God's infinite value in worthiness, okay? The second aspect that we see is that of a visible sign of his excellent character. It's God's character visibly seen. Think, think Romans 1 or Isaiah 6, where, where you can see God's glory or character on display through the things we see and touch in this world. So we have two aspects of glory, his honor and worthiness, and his character on display through creation. So in verses 31 and 32, both of these aspects of glory are being expressed. Jesus is speaking about both God's honor and worthiness and his holy character on display. Now, in these first two verses, notice the word glorified. Glorified and glorified are there five times in these two verses. And two of these times are written in the past tense as if Jesus is saying, it has already taken place. I have already been glorified. Right when Judas leaves the scene, notice the word there, now. Now, at this moment, when Judas leaves to do what he needs to do, the ball of the work of redemption is beginning to roll, and the Son of Man is glorified. You see, in the same way Judas's mind was already set to go and betray Jesus, Jesus' mind was already set to go to the cross of Christ. 
Nothing is changing his mind at this moment. It is already a fact before it even happens. Jesus is saying, my mind is so set. I am so ready. It's such a reality that I am going to the cross and being glorified that it is like it's already accomplished. Jesus' father is glorified in him, and Jesus is soon death and glorification would quickly be a reality. So this is where we need to slow down for just a moment and ask the question, how is Jesus and his father glorified at the cross? And this is where that definition we just said is helpful. We want to look at how the cross of Christ both, both honors and displays the character of God. And so how is God glorified then at the cross? So two passages I believe that are super helpful for us this morning. Philippians 2, 8 through 11 says, In being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, if you flip over to John 17 with me, Jesus here praying the high priestly prayer. If you go down to verse 4 with me, it says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So to answer our question about the cross, we first must realize that if you want to see the glory of God, you must first see Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4 says that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of God's holy nature because Jesus is God himself. He perfectly reveals the excellent character of God. When we see Jesus, listen, we see God. Now let's talk about the cross. The cross where Jesus, God in flesh, took on the weight of sin in history, both the holy wrath of God and died in our place. The cross where the fury of sin is brought to a complete stop. The cross where God's just punishment is paid in full and is satisfied. The cross where the innocent lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world. Carter and Redberg says, There is no place we can look to better understand who God is than at the cross. There's no place we can look and more clearly recognize that he is worthy of all honor and glory than at the cross. The cross is the highest moment of God's revelation to mankind. In the cross, we learn more about God's excellence than in any other moment in history. In the death of Jesus, we see God's holiness and love, righteousness and mercy, justice and grace, sovereignty and humility, wisdom and patience. If we want to understand who God is, we must study the cross. So we sing every week about the cross. I'll never forget an internship at Parkwood. One of the simple lessons I learned was that every single week when I plan services, no matter what the theme is, no matter what the topic is, we must take a trip to Mount Calvary. Must. The cross is central. The cross is our hope. The cross is where we go to when life is so challenging and so difficult. We need to be reminded of God's love and grace for us every single day. The cross is the centrality of our heart. That's where we most clearly can behold the glory of God. So the only way to know the holy God of the universe is through the cross of Jesus Christ, where Jesus died for our sins, and where God's grace and mercy flow like a never-ending river to cover us with forgiveness. So here's our answer. How is God glorified at the cross. At the cross, Jesus, the perfect son, 
reveals his father's holy character and satisfies all his perfect and righteous demands through his death. And because of this, God the Father seals the glorification of the Son by raising him from the dead, ascending him into heaven, and crowning him the king above all kings. At his name, all people bow to the glory of God. So can I just say this to you? Don't forget the cross. On your worst days, when everything seems to be falling apart, on your best days, when all the blessings of life come, never quit looking at the cross where our gracious Savior most fully reveals the glory of God and made us right with Him. The cross of Christ gives glory to God. Second truth that we see in verses 34 and 35 is that the cross of Christ commands the community of faith to love one another. The cross of Christ commands the community of faith to love one another. So go with me back to verse 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So, as Jesus continues speaking in verse 33, go back with me there, it says, yet a little while I am with you. But please don't miss that small phrase right before where he says, little children. Uh, this is a simple expression of sympathy, sympathy or love and tender care. Jesus realizes that this news that he is leaving is hard for his disciples to understand. He knows they're hurting. So then he explains how his leaving will impact their relationships with one another. That, that ultimately the cross where God is glorified will be the heartbeat of a new way to love and care for one another. So a few things I want you to see in this section. First, notice that through the cross, the community of faith is now able and commanded to love one another sacrificially as Christ loved us. We're now able. We're both willing and able to love as Christ loved us. In order to love like Christ, we must first have a relationship with Christ. Before we can overflow with God's sacrificial love, we must first encounter God's sacrificial love for us. You see, before the cross, we have no way of loving as Christ loved us. It's futile. It's impossible. God has to do something, and praise God, he does. 1 John 4 says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So when Jesus goes to the cross, he forgives us and gives us right standing before God. But listen, he also replaces our old sinful selves with his spirit. He gives us a new song to sing. He gives us a new heart. He places his love inside of us, and this is how we respond. We respond by beaming out God's love to those around us. God's love for us allows us and compels us to love others in the same way. You see, Jesus isn't actually leaving his disciples alone. No, he is leaving them together. And that's a profound thought. He's leaving them together. Now, this implies a few things, doesn't it? One, that, that our loving, our fellow brother and sister is a reflection or representation of Jesus and God's holy character. Secondly, it implies that we as God's people need one another. We need one another. I need you, and you need me. We need each other. And I'm just reminded of this. So last night, uh, we're getting ready for bed. And I cut on Facebook. I'm not a big scroller. I just go for the first three posts. So if you're past my three posts, I don't see your post. <laughs> but I scroll down, I, about three posts down, and I see a, a post from a parent who's, uh, whose kids went to school with me in high school. And in the post, 
um, the mom was saying, would you please pray for our family because uh, we lost our nephew suddenly. Now, I know their nephew. I went to school with him. He was a few years younger than me. So I just went on his name to make sure that was the same guy, and it was. And when I went on there, I started seeing what actually happened to this guy I went to school with. It says that he committed suicide, and then suddenly he has a kid. He was married. Now, I say that because one of my other friends posted, and I thought it was so profound. We don't know what's going on in each other's lives. We don't know what's going on in our minds. Mental health is a thing. You need to carry my burdens. I need to carry your burdens. Who knows what would have happened if my friend in school would have simply reached out and asked for help. And let me say this. For, the, for us, we should have simply reached out to him as well. Same is true for us today in this room. We should know each other. We need each other. We're caring each other. We're helping each other, right? A simple truth is that often Jesus meets the needs of his people through his people. Isn't that amazing? Like, like we have the honor to reflect God's love to one another. To, to sacrificially love one another, to care for one another, to hang out together, to invite each other to our homes, to help carry each other's burdens. The list goes on and on. The point is this, that Jesus commands his people through the authority of the cross to love one another as he has loved us. Now, as we continue here, we see secondly, that as the community of faith loves one another, we demonstrate Jesus to a watching world. Go with me to verse 35 again. Jesus says, By this all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. So our loving one another inside the faith community goes much further than just in our specific community, doesn't it? Like, in reality, our love for one another is a catapult for going out in a local and global missions with the love of Christ. Our love for one another should be so striking, so appealing. It should be so remarkably different that the world around us immediately recognizes us as Jesus' followers. Now, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 11 really quick. Because I believe Acts chapter 11, 20 through 26, is one of the most perfect examples of this in the entire Bible. Acts 11. So at this point, the gospel is beginning to go out to the Gentile world. And it says there, uh, Acts 11, starting at verse 20. <clears throat> but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and the great number who believed turned to the Lord. Now drop down with me to verse 23. So when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church, taught a great many people. And if you have a pen, I would encourage you to underline that last line. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, I'm just going to spend a few more moments on this. But notice that while the Lord is growing and multiplying this community of believers, and as they worship together, and as they live life together, notice who calls them Christians. This is profound. Notice who calls them Christians. It's not the community of faith who's calling themselves Christians. It's the watching world around them who calls them Christians. That their watching world was so compelled at this community in Antioch that when they looked at them, they saw what they were doing and they couldn't help but to say, it's like Jesus living among us. They're like little Christ. And oh, brothers and sisters, my prayer for this is true for us this morning, that 
our faith community would be so wrapped up in the love of God, so focused on loving one another as Christ has loved us that the watching world around us is like, that's like Jesus living among us. They're like little Christ. You see, loving one another isn't an option in the faith community. It's essential. It's a command. Jesus says, my love for you at the cross gives you the ability, the ability to, and it commands you to love one another as I have loved you. So first, the cross of Christ gives glory to God. Secondly, the cross of Christ commands the community of faith to love one another. And finally, the cross of Christ enables people to follow Jesus. Go with me to verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. So after Jesus explains his leaving and going to the cross and how that's going to bring glory to God and will give a new command of loving one another, we see Peter responding how we would respond in that moment. He's like, okay, yeah, I got it. You're going to be glorified. You want us to love each, each other, but like, where are you going again? <laughs> He's outwardly expressing how the rest of the group feels at this moment. They're still shocked that Jesus is leaving. So right now, I just want to look at a few specific details in this passage. I think there's so much that can be said. I think there's multiple sermons that can be preached about this text. Um, however, I'm going to encourage you to go to your small group this week um, where we're going to be diving a little deeper into this passage and specifically seeing at how Peter, him following Jesus, and all those intricacies. I'm going to encourage you to just go to small group this week for that. But at this moment, I just want, to, want you to see a few specific words. First, go with me to verse 36. Peter says, Jesus, where are you going? And notice verse 36, Jesus says, where I am going you cannot follow me now. I would underline the word cannot. This leads us to this reality that before the cross of Christ, Peter is unable to follow Jesus. He's unable to follow Jesus. Now, there's two reasons for this. One, which is really bad news is that he is morally unable to take up his cross and follow him. He's morally unable. Peter, in his own strength, and by the way, according to John 16, all of the disciples is unable to take up a cross and follow Jesus to death. He's too weak. He needs a greater power that comes through the Holy Spirit. Peter, you think you can follow me to a cross? Man, you're not even going to make it through the night. Peter is so blinded by his own spiritual pride that he couldn't even see his own weaknesses. See, it's, it's easy when he's sitting at a table with Jesus and the rest of the disciples saying, yeah, Lord, I will die for you. It's comfortable. It's easy. But when he is confronted by a hostile crowd a few hours later, he cowers in fear and denies that he even knows Jesus. You see, Peter needed something more. We need something more. He, like us, before the cross of Christ, is unable to follow Jesus. So that's one reason why Peter can't follow Jesus before the cross. The second reason is that Jesus is the only one who could do what he was about to do. The only one. Quote, and what he would do is die, not mainly as an example to inspire them, but as a substitute to save them. Jesus is the only one who could go to a cross to die a sinner's death as our perfect substitute because he is the only one who is perfect. 
he alone is sinless. Only he can satisfy the just punishment of God in our place. You see, we're not forgiven and saved by being beside Jesus, by assisting Jesus, by being behind Jesus, or even imitating Jesus. We're saved and forgiven through Jesus. We're saved through him. We depend on him for salvation. That just simply leads us to the other reality that after the cross of Christ, Peter is able to follow Jesus. Go with me back again to verse 36. He says, Peter, you can't follow me now, but you will follow afterward. I would underline, you will follow afterward. Jesus says, after I go to the cross and accomplish the work of redemption, after I am raised from the dead, and after you receive the gift of the Spirit, you will follow me. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to leave it there and encourage you to go to a small group this week to discuss in further de in detail all these ramifications of Peter following Jesus. But I just want to simply say this morning, praise God for the glorious cross of Christ. We, like Peter, who was once far away from God and unable to follow Jesus, have now, because of the glorious cross of Christ, been brought near to the throne of grace. We've been covered with his righteousness. We've been cleansed and forgiven, and now we are adopted as sons and daughters of God. And if that is not enough, brothers and sisters, we, like Peter, as recipients of God's gracious love, now have the ability and we have the joy of following Jesus no matter the cost for the sake of his name. Praise God for the cross. So what? How can we apply these three truths to our lives at this moment? I have two applications for us. First is Let's look to the cross where God's glory is on full display and receive forgiveness. Let's look to the cross where God's glory is on display and receive forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, I believe God's word. When the word goes out, it accomplishes exactly what he intends for it to accomplish. And I believe the spirit is doing things in this place that we could never imagine. I don't want to waste this moment where we've been rejoicing in the cross of Christ without extending my plea for anyone in this room or watching online to look to Christ and find forgiveness for your sins. We've seen this morning that there is no other place that displays God's glory greater than at the cross of Jesus Christ, where Jesus, God in flesh, willingly bled and died in our place to forgive us of our sins and to make us right with God. And we have seen that after Jesus accomplished the work at the cross, his Father in heaven glorified him by raising him from the dead, ascending him into heaven and crowning him as the king above all kings. If you want to see the fullness of God's glory, you must look to Jesus this morning. There's no other way to see it. There's no other way to be saved. You can be the best person you want to be. You can go to church every single week. You can do a lot of great things in our community, but that's not enough. You can have all the greatest intentions like Peter, but all you will hear if you don't look to Jesus for your salvation is, you cannot follow me now. Just like Peter we can't follow him without first encountering him hanging on a tree, bleeding and dying in our place for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus' invitation for us is to come follow him. And that's simple, to repent of your sins, to turn away from them, have nothing to do with your sins any longer, and pull, put your full trust and weight on Jesus for your salvation.
I just encourage you, don't wait another day. Don't wait another moment. Look and see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, who went to a shameful cross to die for you, who rose from the grave to completely conquer sin and death forever. Receive that forgiveness today. Second application for us. This is for the body of Christ. Within our faith community, let us pursue one another and sacrificial love for the sake of the world around us. In our faith community, let us pursue one another in sacrificial love for the sake of the world around us. Let me invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 3 with me. First John chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 16 through 18. John says, starting at verse 16. By this we know love, that he laid his life down for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So I think if we were honest this morning, we would all say that the church, not just our church, all churches, Big C Church, Global Church, has done a pretty pitiful job with this application. There was a time in church history where the church would go out and murder people just because they wanted to share the gospel. They're killing other people. I mean, seriously, think about the stories that probably you have and that I have that we know of fellow believers not loving one another but actually hating one another. How many churches do we know have split up because of the color of a floor? Or, or, this is a good one, the style of music we play and sing. Or how about the cemetery ministry? Or some other little ministry that really doesn't matter, but churches split up all the time of this stuff. That just scratches the surface, doesn't it? Like, there's a plethora of reasons why churches split up and don't like each other. Like, no wonder the church has such a bad reputation in our world. We can't even get along to agree with the color of flooring, let alone actually attempting to invite one another in our homes to eat and live life together. Like, can I just encourage us this morning to stop making excuses for why we can't love our fellow believer and simply let's just start doing it. Let's let our faith and doctrines that we so hold dearly be a catalyst for true sacrificial love for our fellow believer. It's, it's not enough to say you believe something. Anybody does that. Let our faith be more than words. Let our songs be more than words. Let it be action. Let us genuinely reach out and care for each other. Like we said earlier, we need one another. Can I ask us this question? What cost have you paid to love your fellow brother and sister lately? What cost have you paid to love your fellow brother or sister lately? I'm reminded, I guess a little over a year now, uh, Kobe Bryant died. I'm a big basketball fan. And it just shook the world. And so inside the NBA had this special uh, presentation right after he passed away. And it was at the Staples Center. 
And, and so they're interviewing all these players who knew Kobe personally and just was asking them how they felt through this time. And the, the, all of them were great. All the interviews were great. But the specific one that just made headlines was the one with Shaquille O'Neal because Shaq was a teammate for Kobe for a lot of years, and they won a lot of championships together. So they're asking Shaq, well, how do you feel? And he just starts weeping, and he says, man, I just wish I would have took more time to reach out to him. Like, I don't know when the last time I texted him before he passed away. I pray that's not said about the community of believers here at this church. Can I encourage you, if you aren't already, reach out with phone. Just call somebody sometimes. Love one another. Spend life together. When's the last time you took a church member out for coffee? Or the last time your family and another family of the church did something together? When's the last time you had someone from the church over to your house just to have dinner? When's the last time you extended a hand to a person in our church who was in need or prayed for or was with a fellow believer who needed a shoulder to cry on? When's the last time you care for those or just reached out to those in your small group or if simply just went to a small group to live life with people. You see, loving one another doesn't have to be complicated. It's not complicated, but listen, it is costly. It is costly. To see other people grow in the love of Jesus costs you something. To truly Live out this command to love each other as Christ loved us is costly. It might cost you money. It might cost you gas or time or an event that you had on your calendar. The point is, is that for us to take steps away from this American ideology of individualism, we have to purposely begin pursuing situations where we get out of our little worlds and begin getting into other people's worlds and letting people into our world. Listen, the world has enough hate groups. Amen? Has enough hate groups. That category is full. The world needs a loving community of people from all walks of life with a multiplicity of languages and colors of skin united by the truth and gospel of Jesus Christ who genuinely love one another. Oh, church, as I said a few minutes ago, my prayer for our local congregation is that we would look just like the church in Antioch where this community, when they see us love each other unconditionally, sacrificially, would say, it's like Jesus is living among us in this place. Like, it's, they're like little Christ. May that be true about us this morning. So brothers and sisters, let's do it. Let's pursue one another with sacrificial love for the sake of the world around us, for the sake of the broken and lost, for the sake of the glory of God. The world desperately needs to see true love that only comes from Christ. So as I close, as God's people, let's love one another as Christ loved us so that those in the world can see and believe in Jesus' redeeming love that was displayed at the cross. Amen. Let's pray. Father, now, God, what a humbling passage. Lord, you did go to a cross, a shameful cross, a cross that was meant for mockery and brokenness, Lord. But you revealed the full glory of God, and we praise you for that this morning. We thank you that at the cross you bought our redemption, Lord, and that you now enable us to love each other. God, I pray with all my heart and for every soul in this room, for those watching online and listening later, God, that our faith would be more than just words, God, that it would be action. God, give us strength, Lord. Forgive us when we have not loved our fellow brother and sister like you've called us to. Father, I just want to pray 
for the soul in the room, the soul online who might not know you. God, would you open their eyes to see Christ Jesus hanging on a tree for the forgiveness of their sin, who's now resurrected from the dead. And oh God, would you save souls today? Oh God, move in this place. Or may we respond by loving sacrificially our brothers and sisters all around us for the sake of your name in this world, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?